volume and quality. I think of myself in some ways as a plumber. Um, if you go to your tap and you turn on the turn on the faucet and water doesn't come out or comes out dirty, you're going to call your plumber and he's going to figure out how the pipes are connected to figure out where the problem is. And essentially, that's kind of what what I do. Venny and Shindell work for the Edwards Aquifer Authority. The EAA must control the supply of water like a bank controls its loans. It releases specific quantities of water as and when it's needed. Like every other city in the world, San Antonio gets through a staggering volume of water every day. Toothbrushing, eight liters a time. Toilet flushing, 16 liters. A 10 minute shower, more than 200 liters. Agricultural and industrial processes up the ante even more. 60,000 liters to spray a farmer's field. Making a reel of newsprint, 100,000 liters. All this demand adds up to one thing, a massive drain on the aquifer. And that gives the water authority an unexpected headache. These springs reveal why. The aquifer feeds into the San Antonio River. Diverting the aquifer for city use could reduce the river's flow. It's a problem facing many areas of the world that depend on groundwater for survival. Areas downstream of the city would be threatened with drought. The consequences would be unthinkable. So the water authority must work out ways of using the city's water supply to replenish the river. And that means recycling. Engineer Daniel Martinez has an urgent task, to carry out a health check on the city's biggest recycling plant. To do so means climbing down into a hot, cramped chamber under the pavement. People stroll by, unaware of the crucial work going on just beneath their feet. The recycling station has been placed underground to preserve the beauty of the area. Its job is to clean the city's used water and feed it back into the San Antonio River to ensure communities south of the city get an adequate supply. All clear. The water is as clean as if it came straight from the aquifer itself. The farmers to the south can rest easy. Can you tell the difference? One of these jars has our Edwards Plateau drinking water in it out of the Edwards aquifer, and the other one has our recycled water in it. Sub-pavement recycling works for so-called grey water, the waste from baths, showers, the car wash. But for toilet waste, a much bigger operation is called for. This is the Dos Rios water treatment facility, just south of San Antonio. It's an impressive name for an impressive place. It's a sewage plant. They call it brown water. These giant grinding blades filter out sludge and garbage. It's perhaps the foulest part of the job. The rank-smelling brown water is next passed through a giant concrete tank. As the water is pumped into these huge outdoor tanks, it meets floating mats of green slime, colonies of oxygen-loving bacteria that eat their way through the sewage to clean the water. Perhaps strangely, the bug farm is odour-free. Insects eating the bacteria would create a bad smell, but the plant is home to a flock of obliging birds. 
And we have a thriving population of purple martins that love to live at this plant. And they're sort of a natural uh, pest control where we don't have to use pesticides. So between the bugs and the birds, it's just a really pleasant environment. After further filtering and laboratory checks, the water is at last ready to join the San Antonio River. Hard to think that something now so clean once entered the treatment plant as a fetid smelling mountain of muck. What a difference a few bugs can make. Five ordinary objects, five extraordinary stories. Coming up, it's an essential part of our daily routine. It's crucial to our health. Yet what is it really made of? And how do they get the stripes in? The secrets behind toothpaste, next on How Do They Do It? This is how billions of us around the world start our day. Pick up a brush, squeeze out a dollop of toothpaste. But how many of us think about what it is we're putting in our mouths? Limestone, quartz, rock salt, sand. Toothpaste is chock full of scouring abrasives that literally scrub our teeth clean. It eats up a billion tons of rock, salt and sand a year. But how do they blend all those gritty minerals into a smooth, minty tasting paste? And how do they make the stripes? It's early morning at the GSK plant just outside London. In just a few short hours, what starts out as a truckload of rock, sand and salt will soon end up as a million tubes of toothpaste. GSK may not be a familiar name, but the brands which use the toothpaste produced here adorn the bathrooms of the world. The secret process of alchemy starts in this computerized control center. It's like making a casserole, actually. Add the ingredients, give it the right mix, and you come out with a, a lovely product. To cook, a chef needs culinary tools, and making toothpaste is no different. What is different is the scale and these huge mixers can mix tons of toothpaste at very high speeds. And we can actually turn over five tons in about five minutes. Essentially, it's just a very, very large kitchen blender. The mega blender must churn the abrasive powders and the dyes and flavorings that go with them into a smooth paste. The heart of the beast itself is this here, which is the homogenizer. We normally just call it a dish -y. Inside the chamber, these enormous paddles are called agitators. They spin at 2,500 RPM, enough to get an average town car up to 30 kilometers per hour. By the time this is finished, you can actually put it into the tubes. You've got something that you can use. It's got to be mixed properly before it actually goes into the main mix. So otherwise, you just get a lot of small lumps, big lumps. You don't want lumpy toothpaste. Once mixed, the toothpaste begins a journey through a freeway of piping. Finally, the paste arrives here in a pressurized chamber. This batch of toothpaste is almost ready, but it's still missing one crucial feature stripes. So how do they keep the stripes from staining the white part of the paste? The answer is viscosity. 
Technicians here must make sure that both white and coloured pastes have the same consistency. There can be no room for error. The technicians must check each batch that comes in from the factory floor. Even the slightest variation in viscosity could spell disaster. The toothpaste has now completed a momentous journey, from quarry blasting to bathroom. Since this program began, nearly 68 kilometers of internet cable has been laid on the world's seabeds. 70,000 tower cranes worldwide have swung into operation. Almost a million pencils have been made. The world has consumed four million gallons of drinking water and used 55,000 tubes of toothpaste. Even the most ordinary objects often have an extraordinary story to tell. We only have to watch and listen.